get you get your own microphone. Do you know where you want it? does not matter. Up to you guys. I'm just gonna wait for the mic. All right, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the auditorium in the Dora McClellan Brown Chapel and Fine Arts Building. Um, really glad that you all are here this morning uh, for our panel discussion on uh, the gospel and race. Uh, I'd like to provide some framing remarks at the outset and then introduce our panelists briefly, um, and then we'll, we'll jump into the conversation. Uh, I recently read an article that was published a couple years ago by Thomas Kidd, who is a historian at Baylor University, um, where Kidd argues that uh, Christian colleges feature surprising levels of ideological diversity, um, even as they unify around common faith. Um, and his theory is that if Christ is at the center of a Christian college or university, uh, that commitment can open up the door for a real range of views on social issues, political issues, etc., because those are second-order issues. Um, at Covenant, certainly Christ is at the center of all we do. Uh, we believe that he is preeminent in all things, and we, um, and I would say the faculty in particular, uh, share common commitments on first-order issues, uh, the inerrancy of Scripture, um, the Westminster Confession of Faith, uh, the college's statement of community beliefs. Uh, and those shared commitments on first order issues um, allow us the freedom to have different views on second and third order issues. Um, and just as crucial as those first order theological commitments are to the academic culture here at Covenant, um, is our commitment as a Christian academic community to engage in conversation, in dialogue, in debate um, about second and third order issues uh, in keeping with Christian virtues such as humility and uh, charity. Uh, we engage in reasoned discourse on a wide range of topics, uh, seeking the truth. Uh, we do so in light of the truth of the Bible. Um, we seek to listen well, humbly acknowledging that as finite beings we have limited perspective. Uh, we are charitable to our conversation partners, not assuming the worst possible interpretation of their words, but instead being generous in our interpretation. Um, we're slow to take offense uh, and quick to forgive. Uh, we don't adopt uh, an us versus them mentality where when someone disagrees with you on anything, they are your enemy. Um, and we remember that when all is said and done, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we are all sinners in need of a Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. These are actually the closing words of a recent denominational statement on racial reconciliation. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Um, in that, this same vein, uh, Jesus says in John chapter 17, um, in his prayer to the Father, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, the Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you have loved me. Uh, conversations about race are nothing new at Covenant College. Uh, I was speaking a couple weeks ago with Randy Neighbors, the founding pastor, Covenant alum and founding pastor of New City Fellowship, and he says, oh yeah, they really began in earnest in 1970 uh, when the college offered its first course in black history. Um, the PCA did not even exist at that point. Um, the college only became a part of the PCA in 1982. Uh, but those conversations about race have picked up steam within the PCA in the last 15 years or so. Uh, in 2004, the General Assembly adopted a pastoral letter on the gospel and race uh, that clarified the denomination's position on important issues relating to racism in the past, the present, and the future. 
Um, one of the folks on the panel was involved in drafting that letter. Uh, in 2016, the PCA General Assembly adopted an overture that specifically confessed the denomination's failures uh, in relationship to the civil rights movement. And in 2018, this past summer, the, the General Assembly received the report of a special study committee on racial and ethnic re reconciliation, um, which I should tell you is a really helpful document. Both that pastoral letter from 2004 and the 2018 uh, racial reconciliation study report are available online. You can Google them and read them. They are great resources for biblical perspective on uh, matters of race. Um, so in some respects, the conversation that happens on our campus is part and parcel of this larger denominational conversation. Uh, as you all know, this year's Reformation Day lectures carried on the theme of Semper Reformanda always being reformed um, and addressed the question of how the church might continue to be reformed in relationship to racial reconciliation. Uh, my hope is that we can use those lectures as a springboard um, to further conversation today about topics along those same lines um, and do so in keeping with the commitments I mentioned just a moment ago, commitments to biblical truth, uh, to humility, and to charity. Um, so I'm delighted to have these four panelists here to engage in our conversation today. Um, we put them in comfortable chairs in hopes that this could be sort of a, a front porch conversation. Uh, uh, and so um, I want to introduce them, and then I'd like to pray, and then we can jump into the conversation. Um, so I will go in the order in which they are seated. Uh, most of you are familiar with Dr. Kelly Capick, who's in his 18th year, 18th year, is that right? On the faculty here at Covenant College as a professor of theological uh, studies. He earned, earned his MDiv at Reformed Theological Seminary, his PhD in Systematic and Historical Theology at King's College University of London. Uh, next to him is Reverend Kevin Smith, uh, who serves as the senior pastor of New City Fellowship here in Chattanooga. Um, he earned his master's in theological studies at Chesapeake Seminary, uh, planted Mount Zion Covenant Church in Bowie, Maryland, and also pastored Pinelands Presbyterian Church in Miami, Florida, and he was the chair um, of the Racial Reconciliation Study Committee that delivered its report uh, this past summer at the 2018 General Assembly, and around here he is best known as Joanna's dad. Uh, next to Reverend Smith is Dr. Carl Ellis. Uh, Dr. Ellis serves as Associate Pastor for Cultural Apologetics at New City Fellowship and as Provost Professor of Theology and Culture at Reformed Theological Seminary. Um, he studied under Francis Schaeffer at Labrie in Switzerland, uh, completed his master's in, the in theology at Westminster Theological Seminary in Philadelphia, and holds a DPhil from the Oxford Graduate School. Um, he was a member of the study committee that produced the report this past summer and also was involved in drafting the 2004 uh, pastoral letter on the gospel and race. Um, and last but not least, at the end of the row is Professor Alyssa Weichbrot. Uh, Dr. Weichbrot is in her sixth year at Covenant. Uh, she serves as an assistant professor of art uh, she has a specialty. She teaches a really interesting class on race and gender in American art that I know a lot of you have enjoyed. Um, she's also a Covenant alum, graduated in 2004, uh, earned her MA and PhD in art history, criticism, and conservation at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I'm really grateful to these folks for joining us today for this conversation. Uh, let me open us in a word of prayer and then we can begin. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you have called us to yourself, and that you have made us one uh, in you. And so we pray uh, that your spirit would unite us even now um, as we have a conversation on important issues. Father, uh, guide us uh, to truth um, in humility and charity. Uh, I pray that you would use this, uh, this conversation uh, to mold us more and more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I pray. Amen. All right, I've asked these folks uh, at the outset um, just to share some, some thoughts on issues or ideas that were uh, raised via the Reformation Day lectures. Um, and, and sort of as a preamble to that, I've asked Professor Capic if he could just say a little bit about what it is that we try to accomplish in academic lectures uh, here at Covenant. So take it away, Kelly. Thanks, Derek. Uh, I'm impressed you guys are here with all the studying and due dates that you have, gluttons for punishment, so thanks for coming. Uh, just so you know, we've, we do academic lectures, we bring in outside speakers, so one of the great things we do is have a fantastic residential college here. And sometimes I think we sound apologetic when we say, you know, we live in a bubble. There, are, everyone lives in a bubble. If you live in New York, you live in a bubble, right? So we all live in bubbles. And uh, that's not necessarily bad. There's some really good things to it. But one of the dangers is if you don't listen to people outside of your bubble. 
So one of the things we've done um, for a long time is we bring in outside people, um, often that we, it just from, from a variety of disciplines and backgrounds to speak into our community, because it's a way, it's a, it's a less expensive way to get all of us off of the mountain, right? You bring one person here or a couple of people here. And uh, Reformation Day lectures, Dr. Green and I, it's been probably 16 years that that's been going on, and it's been a great privilege. And in particular, Reformation Day lectures, I think sometimes people get confused about this. Um, I'm a Reformed theologian. I love the Reformed tradition. Um, but we've got to be careful we don't romanticize what we love, because then it's not real. So one of the things that we do in the Reformation Day lectures, and we have always done, is we ask people to come and often talk about the past, but not always talk about the past. Sometimes they'll uh, talk about the past in order to inform the present or the future. This has happened in all manner of lectures, whether it's been someone talking about Jonathan Edwards and bringing up problems, uh, or uh, it, it, whether it's been topics or people, and that's been very valuable to us. Part of Part of what I would remind us of is uh, Yazov Pelikan made a strong distinction a long time ago, the difference between tradition and traditionalism. Mm. Tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the belief that nothing new can ever be said or done. And we don't want, it's not part of our tradition, we're the reforming church under the authority of Scripture willing to question and revise. So, Part of our faithfulness to the tradition is not simply rehearsing the past, but engaging uh, the present. And uh, a couple quick thoughts on that, and then, and then I'll be done. Covenant loves the church. This place, if you look at the statistics of students who graduate and go to the church, it's, it's astronomical. Covenant loves the church. Covenant is not the church. Covenant College is a liberal arts college. Which means, this is one of the reasons I love being here. To be honest, I love teaching here rather than a seminary because what happens here is I will start talking about economics and then one of my friends will, you know, Dr. Figure will go, that's interesting, Kelly. I mean, you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> right? Because you're a theologian. And one of the things we value here is r rigorous, careful thinking from different disciplines. So we bring people in. We, they help us. In our conversations, this is a liberal arts environment, and that is a gift from God. So in this way, as a liberal arts environment committed to the Reformed tradition, we serve the church, but we're not the church. Um, so, and then the final thing is, it, it, part of this is cultivating knowledge and empathy. And in terms of our most recent Reformation Day lectures, since this is a discussion on race, one of the things we do is look for areas where our tradition has struggled. This isn't the first time. I, I'd have to look it up. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Uh, we brought a scholar whose Oxford University Press book included a heavy dealing with the beginning of the PCA and some of the really racially charged problematic parts of the PCA's past. We've done that. It's important for us to own it and to know about it. So this is part of us being faithful. All right, I think we'll just move, move down the line. And uh, Reverend Smith, I'll let you give some initial thoughts or reflections. Uh, the question is, why are we still having this discussion about racism? Aren't we a post-racial society? Didn't we elect a black president? Um, aren't we, this, this is the 21st century. Aren't, isn't your generation somehow the generation that's beyond uh, race issues? And the reason we're still having this conversation, and we'll have this conversation, I think, for many years to come, is because it's in the racism, as a, which is a system of oppression based upon ethnicity, is in the DNA of our, of our, of our country. It is, as one writer put it, the uh, original sin of America. Uh, think, you feel me? I mean, think about it. How did our nation begin? Right? First, you got indentured servants coming over who were black and white. Uh, Africans and whites were indentured servants coming to this country. The whites eventually, and there's a story behind it, but the whites were eventually allowed to go free, you know, because indentured servitude is only for a period of time. However, the blacks were kept as servants. One reason, well, because they were strong, they were used to the heat, they could pick the cotton. My mother picked cotton, 
y'all. So I know, I, know, I know a little bit about that in Georgia. And they were strong. And, so they need, and it was about money. <laughs> it was about economics. And these slaves were strong, and they could continue to do it. Then the idea, be, well, you have to justify that, right? Because we're, we're a Christian nation, so we have to justify keeping these people in that bondage. So we started developing a theology, but also a cultural understanding of what we now call whiteness and white supremacy. Now, here's a, here's a striking thing. The founding fathers were fighting for freedom. They were fighting for their freedom from English, British tyranny. They were fighting to be free, uh, no taxation without representation. They felt enslaved to Europe. They felt enslaved in particular to, to the Brits. And they wanted to be free to govern themselves, to uh, you know, govern their own destiny. And while they sh shed blood to earn that freedom, at the same time, what were they doing to the Native Americans? And what were they doing to the Africans? While they fought for freedom, they were denying freedom to people in this country. That's called hypocrisy. This is why it continues to be an issue in our country. It's part of the founding DNA of our country, and it bubbles up. It, it, even though, even as we've gotten more enlightened, it keeps bubbling up because it's in the DNA. And as, the, and as Christians, my family, we have the only real cure mm. for this sinful malady from this sinful DNA that's part of our country's system and thinking. We have it. And so we have to continue to talk about it because it, it, just, it hurts the Great Commission. Because how can we reach people if we don't see the Imago Dei in them, for one, and if we don't see them as human beings worthy of respect and dignity, how can we truly disciple them? And in the PCA, we've struggled. I've been in the PCA almost 30 years now. We've struggled with that, and I'm, I'm excited, actually, to see our denomination talking more about these issues in a real way, not just academically as former committee, but let's get down to brass tacks, let's get down to feet on the ground, and the painful necessity of dealing with our past and present as we, as we think about how God will take us into the future as a church and as the people of God. Thanks, Kevin. Carl? Okay, um, yes, uh, this is a part of our DNA uh, as a country, uh, but it should not be a part of the DNA of the church, okay? Um, I tend to look at it from more of a theological point of view that if you go all the way back, I mean, if you look at the Bible itself, let's take the Bible as it comes in the raw, all right? There are two aspects uh, of theology that come across in the Bible. There's those things that are concerned with what we should know about God, okay? I call that side A. And then there are those other aspects that deal with how we should obey God, at side B. Now, as the Bible comes at us straight up in its natural state, it seems, to, it impresses me as being more side B oriented than side A. Does that make sense? However, that's not to say that side A is not a good thing. Okay, so the church starts, uh, early theology starts, and what happened in the European slash Western context, uh, Christianity came under the uh, influence or came under the challenge of unbelieving philosophy and then later unbelieving science. And therefore, in order to defend the faith and communicate the faith, we had, to do the, we had to change the language of our theology from its concrete form like you find in the Bible to a more technical form. So that's where we get terms like superlapsarianism and all that kind of stuff, the <laughs> hypostatic union. You don't find these things in Scripture. I mean, you don't find those words in Scripture. You find the concepts in Scripture. So we had to learn how to really 
uh, defend the faith and communicate the faith in, in a more technical uh, way. And as a result, we became much more oriented in the West on side A, what we should know about God. I mean, we, 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 have, we, we have inherited from the Reformed tradition tremendous uh, things like the distinctions like between the, uh, the economic trinity and the ontological trinity and those kind of things. So, but in our focus on side A, we have tended to slip and be lax on side B. So let's, so we, so we have the strong theology, but if you look at the Westminster uh, standards, like the larger catechism, it's got a whole lot of side B stuff in it, but we came up with a shorter catechism, which cut out a lot of that. But anyway, that's, a, that's, another, <laughs> that's another story. But we tended to focus on side A, and, and we were weak on side B. So when things like racism came up, and for example, you go all the way back to uh, the, 14th, uh, the 15th century, uh, documents like the doctrine of discovery and, and things like that, which basically said that uh, this, is, this came out in, uh, what was it, what was the year? Uh, 1493, because uh, 1492, Columbus sailed the mm -hmm. o ocean blue. Okay, yeah, 1493. Okay, basically said that Christian Europe, okay, had the right to confiscate land and to claim it and all the rest of that, and the people who live in those lands have no rights, all right? They can occupy, but they don't have a right for, for possession. And, 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 and by that time, you, you, you have a Christianity that's identified with Europe, Europeanness. You have that coupling. So that, that, it goes all the way back there, and, and, and that DNA carried on into, into Western, Western culture and all the rest of that. So we, we, we end up having a Christianity that is very much oriented to Western European uh, realities. Now, there's nothing wrong with being Western or European, absolutely nothing wrong yeah. with that. The problem is when we, when, when, we, when we define Christianity in terms of those things. So you take those things, plus a weakness on side B, and then you come to America, and then you have the slavery thing develop, you can see how that can kind of get mixed up, and you can see how it can taint the DNA of the church in America. All right, so, so what we need to do then, we need to really look at our Bibles again with an open mind and see what God is really saying and take things like Imago Dei seriously, and take things like dignity, identity, and significance seriously, those kind of things, and how, how, how God deals with us. Uh, the other thing that we have to re recognize is that while there are a lot of sins committed by the Western church, okay, that doesn't mean that the Western church has not given us some very valuable things that we can cherish. I mean, after all, most of the psalms were written by a murderer and, adulterer and, a, and an adulterer. You, know, you understand what I'm saying? That just shows you that God, by his grace, does great stuff in spite of our mess. So we're all a mess. So no matter what tradition you follow, you, you, so I know some people who are Afrocentric. Yeah, right, go on and be Afrocentric. You find a whole lot of mess there, too. We're all messed up. And by God's grace, then, we can, we can pull, pull together the things that God gives us uh, and cherish those things and also expand our horizons so we can include other contributions made by other people in other parts of the world who are biblically sound that we've often forgotten. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where we need, to, that's where we need to, uh, to deal. We have to understand the nature of our theology, how the weaknesses of it, but, at, but not just throw it all away, but to strengthen it by adding the things that we, we can see today where we've missed the boat. Great, thanks, Carl. Alyssa, any uh, initial thoughts? Well, uh, as an art historian, as a, a cultural historian, um, I'm, I'm interested in the, how things that have been actually made have shaped this discussion that we're having now about race and about the gospel. Um, as a Christian, as a professor at an institution that values integration of faith and learning, I'm really interested in how my discipline of art history can help me, um, can, can provide insight, can help me understand even some of my theology better, right? Um, and one thing that has been really fruitful for me 
um, in thinking about the Imago Day and in wondering why has it been so hard for us to see the Imago Day in other people? That it's such a fundamental doctrine. Um, this is why. Why is it? Why has it been historically and continues to be so difficult for us to see the inherent dignity of all people who are created in God's image? And. It, it might be tempting sometimes for us to think, well, if you can't see the Imago Dei in someone, that's just like a you, sin, individual problem. And something that art history has helped me recognize is that there's a, a whole other host of things going on culturally that are shaping and that are blinding um, how we are able to see others. So, for example, um, a lot of the work that I do, a lot of the scholarship that I do, is looking at what I call our, our visual archive, the, the bank of images that you carry around in your mind um, that help you categorize people. So if you think about what does a leader look like or what does beauty look like, the first thing that pops into your mind when somebody says um, that something, that, that, oh, that woman is beautiful, you know, what is it that comes to your mind? That's your visual archive, and that's shaped not only by fine art, by the stuff that you see in museums, but it's also shaped by vernacular culture, by popular art, um, by movies, by advertisements, by all the things you see on social media, things like that. So something that's been helpful for me is to look at how um, our very notion of race in America has been shaped very much by images. Our understanding of race was not shaped just by words. It was not shaped by, um, it, images were used in the service of science or pseudoscience in order to make certain claims about certain groups of people. Images in popular culture perpetuated really, really harmful stereotypes. And a lot of those stereotypes still persist. They may have taken slightly different forms, but they continue to show up um, in some really, really insidious kinds of ways. And so I encourage all of us to, to think about how what we have seen might be keeping us from seeing well. You know, how, how the things that you have consumed, perhaps unthinkingly, that you just have even seen in your, or, or, or that you haven't seen. If you haven't seen an image of a black female in leadership, then you might not have a category for that. And it can be really disruptive for you when you encounter a powerful black woman in person because you don't have, you, you, you have not been taught to see that well. Does that make sense? Um, and so part of our responsibility as Christians in order to see each other fully as bearing the Imago Dei, part of the groundwork we can do is expand our visual archive, is to look for other kinds of representations of people um, that go outside of the stereotypes, that go outside of the easily categorizable uh, boxes that we prefer to put people into and to be disrupted by that and to be willing to step into that disruption because we believe in the Imago Dei. That's great, thank you. As a, as a historian, I think one of the, it's really fascinating um, so the, the, the history of how we perceive uh, what, what's beautiful or what's attractive um, and the, the uh, unusual situation we find ourselves in in the United States. So American, white Americans love to, you know, go get a tan. Like if you get a tan, that's a symbol of a fact that you've got enough leisure time to go sit on the beach or be out in the sun or that kind of thing, which is exactly the opposite of how darker skin is perceived in most parts of the world where you have darker skin because you're out laboring in the fields. And so when we've had uh, opportunity to inter interact with our Indonesian friends, you know, they want to make sure they're not in the sun because that will make them darker. And that's considered less beautiful um, in those cultures, whereas we in in the post-industrial or the industrial West think, well, you know, if you, if you have the resources to be leisured, you can get outside and get some sun, and that's a, a symbol of health and vitality and, and beauty. Um, it's a, interesting how that history plays out. Um, so I, there were, I think, a lot of really great things that we heard about in the Reformation Day lecture that are, are helpful. I mean, you, we've already talked about the importance of this doctrine of the Imago Dei, and I think even about how um, that was something that was so important to early abolitionists. Uh, I remember, you know, Josiah Wedgwood's little emblem 
um, of, the, of the slave in chains that says, am I not a man and a brother? I mean, this clear statement that um, these, these slaves are also created in the image of God. Um, and and uh, you know, some real honesty about the hard parts of the church's uh, history or legacy, particularly in the United States with regard to race. Um, I, I really appreciated a call to godly grief as opposed to, to white guilt. Um, I think that's biblical and an, an acknowledgement of the, of the fact that the pursuit of justice is likely going to mean discomfort. And, that's, and Scripture tells us, of course, that if we're believers, we should expect discomfort in life. We shouldn't expect to be comfortable. Um, an exhortation not to make any political party the Christian party. Um, and we're, we're perhaps as aware of that now as we ever have been. That it's very difficult to align Christian faith with any one of our two political party options here in the United States. Sometimes I wonder if we'll ever have an anti-revolutionary party like Abraham Kuyper founded, a third, a third way. Um, and, uh, and certainly I would say one of the most interesting things that I heard in the lectures was, was a, a, a call to awareness of, uh, of group solidarity in, in the minority experience that those of us who are majority culture folks and um, tend to be, in, the, in America at least, very individualistic, uh, aren't aware of. We don't feel the pain of other um, of other folks of our same uh, people group because we're, we're not used to that sort of minority group solidarity. We're in this together kind of experience. Um, so there are a lot of really helpful things I think that, that came out. Uh, certainly there were also questions or issues that came out of the lectures that might deserve some further uh, conversation. So I wanted to pose a few questions to the panel and, and see if I could get thoughts um, from you guys on these things. And one of those was just how should we as Christians think about um, about our calling in relationship to issues like social justice, um, and, and particularly our, our one question that, that arose is, are Christians called particularly to racial justice, um, and how do, we, uh, how do we balance that with other biblical calls to justice, justice with regard to the widow, the orphan, um, the poor, the, the immigrant? Um, how, do, how do we respond to biblical justice, or the, call to, the biblical call to justice in light of our finitude as human beings, um, and are we all called particularly to racial justice? H how do we think about that? Can I just read a passage? If you yeah. To reflect? James chapter 1, 27. A religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unstained from the world. My brothers, chapter 2, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And then he goes on to talk about the poor man versus the rich man coming into the church. The, the point being is that the New Testament and the Word of God is, is challenges us to think about these issues and calls it part of our religion, part of our faith. It is not optional for us to to, to, to this issue of social justice um, or, or, or even the issue of, of, of racism or, 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 or classism. Uh, the Bible calls it partiality. We are looking at a failure to apply the word of God to, to our situation. Uh, if our founding fathers in, in the church of that day had done that, we wouldn't even be talking about this issue. But they didn't, and so we are. Now, are we going to be the church? So I, I, would, I would just call us to just go back and be, begin looking at the scriptures, even the New Testament, not just Old Testament, though there's much there that we need to listen to. But even in the New Testament, we have this call to care for those around us who are powerless, who are the widow, the orphan. In their, visit them. When he says visit, he didn't mean just go hang out and say, how you doing? <laughs> And just, yeah. <laughs> Visit meant get involved. It meant actually minister to them in their affliction, in their situation. It actually meant you got to put some skin in the game. Um, and when he tells us, show no partially as, partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Do you, why does he add all those? Why did he just add as you hold the faith, and then he adds, in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. Because he's recognizing that partiality, whether it's racial, we saw what we call racism, or class, or in this case, the, the example he gives is cl classism. Um, 
If we do those things, he is telling us that we are denying the faith and we are bringing dishonor to the Lord of glory. I don't know what else to say. I would just add to that that uh, the, uh, the scripture um, we are admonished to be uh, to be kind to all people, especially those in the household of faith. And I think uh, I think when we think about justice and those kind of things, I mean, there's nothing much I can do about the world acting a fool out there, okay? But we in the body of Christ have no business imitating that. And 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 and, and where where it really gets bad is when we then we I, I have this concept I call cultural sin. You know, there are practices out there in the culture that are just plain old sinful. And we in the body of Christ should never participate in that. And so, um, so my wife talks about the concept of an alternative witness. And I think that's the body of Christ must be an alternative witness. I don't think God is calling us to go out there and make everything right out there or make history come out right and all the rest of that. Although we, we do have an effect on things out there. But Within the body of Christ, we should at least have that together, that, that we don't practice these, these sinful things that are in the culture. We don't conform to the world, you know, be not conformed to the world, be, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Uh, those are the things we must do within the body of Christ. And then that in and, of, in and of itself becomes the alternative witness and gives us the moral high ground then to, be, to begin to denounce these things in the larger society. But the problem is when we practice those cultural sins or have a history of that, we give up the moral high ground and we ruin our own witness. So that's, I think that's, I just want to clarify that, you know, some people think that we should be social service agencies out there. No, we should, we should do these things within the body of Christ, mm -hmm. especially, and knowing that that will spill over. Like I think of the early church in Rome, they, they took care of, uh, you know, infants that were abandoned. Uh, and they took care of them. And it didn't matter if they, these, they were abandoned by Christians or not. You know, they just took care of them. And they also ministered to people who, were, who had the plague and that kind of thing. Uh, that was a great witness. But the church, the reason the church was able to do that is because the church practiced that in, in the body. And therefore, it spilled over. And that's, that's the kind of way we, we need to, uh, I think that's what we need to proceed with. We have no business practicing uh, cultural sin. So segregation and all those kind of things. Uh, that were practiced by the church are just, uh, there's no excuse for that. And it's caused a lot of people to stumble, even lose their faith. Uh, uh, so just, I just add that. Yeah. Ellie, were you going to ask? Yeah, I mean, I so appreciate what you, you guys say. And just even reflecting again on James and elsewhere, I do think there, it's worth mentioning because the Bible does talk about not showing favoritism, right? And I think we can struggle with this a little bit because people say, yeah, but God doesn't show favoritism. <laughs> well, actually, he does show favoritism, right? And, and so we've got to be real careful about what we, what we understand there because when it's true, God does not show favoritism. And because God does not show partiality, he is by necessity partial to the poor. He's partial to the orphan, and he's partial to the widow. If he's not, if people are in situations like this, and he acts like they're not, that's not impartial. That's not just. So if for him to be impartial and not show favoritism requires partiality. And that's how the prophet Isaiah seems to see it. That's how James seems to see it. And I think that's how the church should see it. And, and I would, the last thing I would just say there is this stuff's so difficult. I'm a white male. And the reality is these are discussions that have to be embodied. And ideas are overrated sometimes. And I'm a college professor, and I've, my whole life is about ideas. But we have got to become better listeners. We've got to be with people. Otherwise, we don't get anywhere in this. But because of God's impartiality, he is partial to the poor, the orphan, the widow, and the marginalized.
Okay, let's see on anything. Good point. I, th I think particularly at Covenant, we should probably distinguish between little c and big c calling if we're going to be talking about our Christians particularly called to this. Um, and, I, and I think what we're hearing here is that as Christians, we are all called to care about justice. We are all cared, called to care for the poor, the orphan, the widow, those who are, um, have been oppressed. And yet, there might be some of you who are particularly and vocationally called to focus in on care for a certain kind of oppression. Mm -hmm. There may be some of you who may be vocationally particularly called to care particularly for women, who might be care called to care particularly for racial and ethnic minorities, who might be cared to call particularly for orphans, for the poor. All of these kinds of uh, experience, these lived experiences inflect each other. They can't be separated out from each other, so they're necessarily going to be entangled. But you, none of you should feel like you need to drop out of school right now and do all of the things all of the time <laughs> um, in order to fulfill this general Christian calling of, of caring for those who are unseen. That's great. Thank you. Um, another question that might be veering toward a little bit more toward the theological. Um, we operate out of a tradition that has a very high view of Scripture. Um, we generally don't play fast and loose with biblical texts. We tend to be pretty guarded about um, how we employ uh, biblical text. And that's characteristic of our tradition. Um, how, how, do we, how do we think about using scripture uh, to uh, advance justice issues. Um, I mean, can we, can we put our own twist on scripture for the sake of advancing a justice issue? Uh, do we need to be careful about putting our own words into passages of scripture to advance an issue that's, that is advanced somewhere else in scripture? And, and I guess the sort of the theological question is, is that a part of um, other traditions in terms of their hermeneutic or how they employ scripture that's not a part of our reform, and particularly PCA tradition, which has such a high view of the word of God. I'm out for this one. This is like theological big team. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I don't want, I'll, I'll just say this. I, I, I hear the concern. Um, if I'm honest, I think it tends to reveal. So I've been in reform circles for many years, and I've heard thousands of sermons, and I've heard great sermons and good creative preachers try and apply the Word of God faithfully, and they will use creativity because they believe it is relevant to today. And it happens all the time. And then it's interesting when we do it on an issue we're not so comfortable with, how it makes us feel, and then we feel like, I don't know if that's a good use of Scripture. And that makes me nervous. I can tell you, we can read from the Puritans taking a passage and modifying it to apply to their listeners and particular things they were dealing with. You can definitely find Augustine and all the early church fathers doing it, and you can find PCA pastors around the world doing it. So we should ask ourselves, why does this make us so nervous? Should we play fast and loose with Scripture? Let's be clear. We can all say it together. No. no. <laughs> right? But the question is, what is the Scriptures talking about? And it's very, I mean, for Paul, the Jew-Gentile thing is not a minor deal. This is, this is takes you to the heart of the gospel. And our... It tells us we have too small of understanding. When we, listen, the gospel is not justification by faith alone. Don't hear me. I believe in justification by faith alone, and it is part of the gospel, but that's too small. King Jesus and his kingdom's the good news. And part of what King Jesus and the good news does is bring justification by faith alone. But if we reduce it to justification by faith alone, it shows we don't have a doctrine of creation. We don't think God cares about the world. And that's a couple hour other conversation. <laughs> Amen. 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 
Yeah, uh, yeah, I agree 100%. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the real, the, the only danger in that, and there, there is a risk when you get creative like that, because, you know, that's one of the reasons folks got angry at Jesus, because he kind of put the pedal to the metal, you know. But um, um, if we see this as an implication of Scripture, that's okay. But we have to be careful not to give the impression that this is defining what Scripture is. Does that make sense? I could say this, this is an implication of Scripture, but this isn't what the, the Scripture says more than that. I mean, you know, if you apply these issues, you know, this uh, thing about justice and partiality and all that to race, that's okay. But there are other applications too, other implications that we have to acknowledge. So let's, we don't want to reduce scripture to a particular thing. Um, but we want to definitely show that this is an implication of it. That's great, thank you. Um, John Perkins, so faculty and staff have been reading uh, this semester his latest book, His Parting Words to the Church on Race, One Blood, which is an excellent book. Um, and in there, he talks about uh, lament. Um, and he says that uh, the concept of lament is heavy. It can seem foreboding and dark if we don't remind ourselves that we're only looking back so that we can move forward with his power. Um, how, how do we balance lament and hope uh, in this sometimes di really difficult work of racial reconciliation. Uh, thoughts on how you've, you've handled that? It's something James again says in chapter four that always makes me think a little bit. Um, and he's calling on his, the people to repent of their worldliness in chapter four. Um, he, 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 he says to them, but God gives more grace. Now he, he, sent, he, he, he laid them out <laughs> about their worldliness and partiality and all the things he'd been talking about. He, he really said, you're guilty. And this is, you're, you're sinful. He, he laid them out. But then he says, but he, that meaning God, gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God can't see it. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Isn't that interesting? God gives more grace. Humble yourself before the Lord. He will exalt you. In the middle of that, he says, lament. Lament over your sinfulness. Lament over your partiality, over your worldliness, of, of, of the quarrels and fights among you. That's in chapter 4. All that's, isn't that what we're dealing with? He says, lament over it. Don't, don't, don't pretend you didn't see it. Don't pretend it's not there. Don't, don't, don't run to the cross so fast that you forget to lament <laughs> and feel the pain and the weight. Here's what's happening. We don't want to feel the pain and the weight of our sin. We want to pretend it didn't. We want to say it's over. We're done with this issue of racism. I'm applying it to this thing. We want to say it's over and done with. Get over it, Kevin. Come on, black people. Come on, you minorities. Get over it. Move on. And yet the church has been complicit in this issue. Where is the lamenting? and the mourning and the weeping. Don't you see? It is in the lamenting and the mourning and the weeping that, that we get grace, that grace is being given to us. That's right. The grace that's given to us leads us to lament and to mourn and to weep. And then as we humble ourselves, he says he will, he will lift us up and exalt us. We will not get up from this. The church in America, I, I believe this, we will continue to fight and struggle with this until we acknowledge the grace that we need that is offered to us, allow it to pierce our souls and lament and mourn and be wretched and confess and admit. We'll never get up. We'll never experience the, the last part of that, which is humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Mm. Mm. That's, that's great hope, mm. but that hope is in the midst of true repentance. Mm. 
Something that I often tell my classes is that Jesus is coming back to make all of the sad things untrue. And so the more sad things that you know, the bigger Jesus has to be in order to undo those things. So rather than being uh, weighed down in our lament, the lament is a, is a means of making Jesus even bigger. Mm. The more that you know about the things that we have to repent of, the more that you understand the, the extent that racial sin, uh, the roots of racial sin, Jesus has to be so much bigger to pull all of that up and to unroot it, to make something beautiful grow there instead. So you don't have to be afraid of the bad things. You don't have to be afraid of looking at history and seeing the ways that, that seeing the places of failure. Those are opportunities for the gospel to become bigger to us, not smaller. It's not, it's not something for us to shoulder. That is something that Jesus alone shoulders for us. I, Doc, that's beautiful. <laughs> She's beautiful. Paul Tripp said it this way. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That should give us great hope. Mm -hmm. Can I, I, I love what you're saying. I do think on this issue it's very interesting because in a Reformed world, we're very comfortable calling ourselves sinners. Bro. Oh. We're real comfortable calling ourselves sinners. Okay. If I call you guys a bunch of sinners, you're going to be fine and you're going to leave. You know where I'm going, don't you? But if I call us a bunch of racists, now you... <laughs> and we got to be honest about that. Why is it? Why is that? Let me tell you something I learned about myself. It's interesting. Our friends here have talked about slavery, and I can guarantee that... I'm supporting you, Tom. I know. We've been through a lot together. But I can guarantee some listener are like, honestly, that was so long ago. Right? What, what about Jonathan Edwards? That's a long time ago. And I was thinking about this for myself. If... I... I my PhD is on Puritans, John Owen. I have learned more theology from John Owen than anyone. He didn't have any slaves. But if someone said that John Owen had raped and pillaged people, how easy do you think it'd be for me to learn from his theology? Hmm. Now watch this. If you're like deep in my heart, you're like, what? John, Jonathan Edwards didn't rape and pillage anybody. He had a slave, which then shows a lot of us don't actually think slavery is that bad. Mm. Ooh. That's what it reveals. Ouch. And until we actually come to the honest, because until we actually, and that's what's painful, we have to be honest with ourselves. Otherwise, we're not listening. And to our... Black brothers and sisters, it's not like, well, I mean, it was just slavery. It's not that. And it betrays, we don't actually think of its wickedness and its lasting effects. So I, I would just say, if we're really reformed, then we of all people are honest about the reality of sin. And that is not just theoretical sin. It's real sins, concrete sins, like being a racist. And being a racist doesn't have to mean you're a white supremacist. It can be deep in us, unconscious, <clears throat> bias, and it's, you can't repent until we actually confess our sins, corporately and individually. Mm. That's beautiful though, right? And the last thing I'll say is, that's what's so unique about Christianity. Christianity says, we're truth tellers. The cross says we're truth tellers. You don't get a more brutal view of the world than Jesus on a cross. Mm. And you don't get a more beautiful picture of the depth of God's love and solidarity in entering in than the same cross. Mm. So we've got to be truth tellers about the brokenness of the world in our hearts and truth tellers about the depth of God's love and grace. Yes. That's what we've got to do. Amen. Wow. <laughs> Uh, we've only got a couple more minutes. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any uh, 
final remarks that you want to make. Or, uh, we, Amen. <laughs> I want to, can I comment on something you read earlier? Yeah. In John 17, when you, we read from the true Lord's Prayer, mm -hmm. um, and Jesus talks about the oneness of his church. He prays for it. Anything Jesus prays for has got to be very important, right? He prays for oneness. And in that passage you read, twice he mentions that the world may believe that you sent me. The oneness that he prays for within the church is actually missional. And, 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 and so that oneness in America is affected by our view of race, white supremacy, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's, it's affected by that. And our disunity, therefore, around ethnicity and preference and all that kind of stuff, uh, prejudice, I should say, not preference, prejudice, um, actually says to the world, Jesus, that God did not send Jesus. It, it works against our mission. And, and, and Jesus, our Lord, knew, our Lord knew that we would have these problems. He wasn't caught off guard. He knew we, the American church would exist. He knew we had issues in this area. And he prayed. And so my commitment as a, as, as a member of the PCA for almost 30 years is this is my family. I'm committed to my family. I don't care what flavor they happen to be, white, black, Hispanic. I'm committed to my family. I could have left a long time ago. I'm not going anywhere. Hmm. The PCA is my family. And I believe this issue of what we want to call it racial unity, or my, my best friend calls it redemptive ethnic unity. Uh, Lance Lewis quoted that it's a beautiful phrase. Uh, what the gospel does by bringing ethnic groups together in Christ. Hmm. This is a matter of the gospel. It is a matter of the mission of the gospel. And so I think we have to really, we, have, we, can't, we can't ignore it. We have to take it very seriously. Because uh, we're saying something that we don't mean to say. That God the Father did not send Jesus. Yeah, that was uh, I want to thank all of you again for uh, giving up an hour in the middle of your day to be a part of this panel. I, I have, you know, 27 more questions that could be asked. I'm guessing there are probably 10 times that out here, um, but we're at the end of the, our time. Um, so thank you. Thank you particularly, uh, Carl and Kevin, for coming up into the soup here on top of the mountain. Um, and thank you, too, for, for your, uh, your faithfulness to our little manifestation of, of the universal body of Christ, the PCA. Um, it's a tr tremendous example uh, for all of us of what you were just uh, talking about, Kevin. I just want to thank you for that. Would you guys please join me in thanking our, our panelists? You are dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>